I'm Laura Lucas Magnuson, and this is The World Unpacked. Every year, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs publishes a survey of Americans' views on foreign policy. In today's episode, our last before the U.S. election, we'll be talking with Evo Dalder, the president of the council, about takeaways from this year's survey. I'm truly excited about this episode, as I worked at the Chicago Council several years ago and have always loved digging into the survey. Thank you for joining us, Evo. Uh, Great to be here, Laura. Evo, in this year's survey, some 68% of Americans responded that it would be best for the future of America if we take an active part in world affairs, a number that is remarkably similar to the answer in the first council survey in 1974, which was 66%. And in fact, except for dipping to a little over 50% in the early 1980s, that number has hovered in the mid-high 60s ever since. And yet through those decades, we have seen highs and lows, the Iraq war, 9-11, the Iran hostage crisis. What do you take away from this relative consistency in America's views of leadership? So I think there's a basic understanding that the American public has had for a very long time. Uh, that the U.S. really doesn't have a choice but being engaged in the world, that the world is out there, uh, that it affects what we do. In fact, in some ways, the COVID pandemic is one of those examples of how something far away can have transformative effects here at home. And the American public, by sort of a two-to-one margin, uh, has figured that out. Um, And it's Interesting that it doesn't really matter who's in power. It doesn't, in terms of the United States and, and the presidency, it doesn't really matter whether we're in the Cold War and post Cold War, whether we're in the middle of a hot war uh, or a, a real peace. Uh, Americans get that we need to be engaged in the world. And you know, for an organization like ours, almost 100 years old, which was founded on the pre- on the principle right. uh, that America's engagement in the world is important. Uh, having Americans actually believing that is, is is gratifying. Now, there are lots of other differences, but on the, this sort of very fundamental idea, Americans believe that playing an active role in the world is important for America's future. So, Evo, it sounds like you weren't surprised that this appetite for American engagement in the world remains consistent despite the ongoing coronavirus and this sort of batten down the hatches feel to 2020. Yeah, every year we think there might be a change. Uh, and then every year it turns out there isn't much of a change. I mean, there, we did reach sort of the top heights in the last few years. We, we, we reached 70% uh, uh, a couple of years ago uh, in terms of American support for an active role. Um, and in part, you, you, you expect this to happen, not only because of what's happening in the world, because there seems to pre- be a presumption among the foreign policy elite uh, in Washington and elsewhere, that Americans want to retreat from the world. It's sort of this fundamental idea that Americans are fed up with what's happening in the world. And every year we find out, no, actually, they're not. They're fed up with some of the policies that are being pursued, right. but they're not fed up with American engagement. And last year, our whole report was about the rejection of retreat as, as a policy option, and we continue to see that. And let's talk about alliances. Um, listeners should know that you and I first met in 2009 when you were nominated to be U.S. Ambassador to NATO, and I was your desk officer. Um, I've actually you know, long supported NATO. My grandfather um, was a naval officer in the 60s and 70s, you know, highly involved in NATO. And I was sort of personally gratified to see then in this survey that 73% of Americans want to either maintain U.S. commitment to NATO or increase it, in fact. Given President Trump has frequently denigrated NATO and reportedly even contemplated pulling out of the alliance, why do you think this support is enduring? Well, it's sort of like oxygen, right? Uh, You don't know how important it is uh, to living until uh, it's no longer there. And to some extent, the attacks that the president has uh, marshaled against our allies and against American engagement and against the leadership role has backfired. Uh, We see this on other issues like trade and uh, as well. But on alliances in particular, support for NATO is is, as high as it's ever been. It's higher than it was in the Cold War, which is remarkable. That was amazing. uh, Because, of course, it's a Cold War organization. It was founded uh, primarily to provide confidence to the Europeans to be able to defend uh, Europe against the Soviet threat. And once the Soviet Union disappeared, many th- people thought NATO would disappear. And 
30 some years later, we're still uh, there and support American support for NATO and American support not just for NATO as an idea and the fact that we want to work with allies, but support for defending allies against a foreign threat uh, is extremely high. Indeed, uh, well over 50 percent uh, think the U.S. should use U.S. troops to uh, defend our Baltic uh, allies against a, a potential Russian attack. Most Americans probably don't know where the Baltics are, but they do understand that having strong alliances is important to American foreign policy. Indeed, when you ask what is the kind of engagement, the active role the United States needs to have, maintaining our alliances is number one. Democrats and Republicans uh, believe strongly that alliances are important. And this is reflected again this year in our survey. One of the interesting numbers against that backdrop then was that you also saw 57 percent of Americans favor President Trump's decision to decrease the U.S. troop presence in Germany, with another 16 percent saying they should all be withdrawn. So how do you reconcile those views of us standing behind our allies, but then maybe not wanting U.S. troops on the ground in Germany, you know, for an extended period of time? So U.S. public views on our presence in Germany has always been uh, contested. Uh, so we asked about the presence of the troops in Germany, in Korea, in Japan, not this year, last year. Uh, and even then, U.S. support for maintaining U U.S. troops in Germany was pretty low, around 40, if I recall right. And and so, um, I mean, clearly, this is a surprising number. It's very hard to have strong alliances when at the same time you support the withdrawal of, in this case, a third of the total number of troops, more than a third of the total number of U.S. troops, uh, a decision which many who care about NATO, including myself, uh, regret uh, uh, the idea that moving 12,000 troops out of Germany is a good idea. So why? Uh, it, you know, you can only speculate. Uh, I think part of it is a belief that Germany has the most powerful and economically well-off country that is competing with us extraordinarily well just should defend itself. Uh, and I think Americans have long believed that burden sharing, having allies do more, uh, is something uh, that is important. Uh, and Germany uh, does a lot, but it doesn't do enough on defense spending. I think that's pretty well known. Uh, clearly, the president has made Germany in particular sort of the bad a child of, uh, of NATO and, and defense spending, and it seems to have penetrated, uh, at least in this one instance. By the way, I think if we were to ask uh, uh, down the line whether maintaining or increasing the number of troops in Germany, we'll probably see under a different leadership and in different circumstances, and if Germany picks up more of the burden uh, of overall security, um, that support would, uh, would stabilize. We'll be right back to talk about polarization. Evo, I'd like to contrast the consistency of Americans who want us to take an active part in the world to the question of whether America has a unique character that makes it the greatest country in the world. You might think that these two questions would be related, as it's not unreasonable to posit that someone who thinks we are unique might also think we have a unique role to play. But here the numbers tell a different story. We have gone from 70% of Americans believing America has this unique character in 2012 to 54% this year. And driving that is a huge drop in agreement with this statement among Democrats in particular. In 2012, 66% of Democrats believe this and just 35% do today. Among Republicans, it's 80%. That is a massive, massive 45 point difference. What's going on? So I think we should separate it for a moment, the question of whether the America is the greatest country in the world or it's just as good as any other country, which is the question we ask uh, from the larger foreign policy issue uh, uh, per se. But what it shows is that Democrats and Republicans increasingly see the world and America's role in it in a different way. While they both agree that uh, America should be engaged, uh, that America should lead, uh, which is what we just talked about in the previous uh, section, they fundamentally disagree on about how to do that. And part of that disagreement is how they see the United States. Now, I see that primarily as a, as a political issue. Uh, Democrats uh, are going to look at a country led by Donald Trump in different ways than Republicans. Uh, 
uh, and a country that elects Donald Trump in different ways than Republicans. And I think that's part of what we see in this question of American exceptionalism. Um, uh, and I also, you know, and, and there is this whole question about how America has dealt with the COVID crisis, how it deals with racism, how it's dealt with inequality. And so it's not surprising that Democrats who are critical of how the United States has handled these issues tend to see America in, in less exalted terms, while those who are more supportive of how we have dealt with these issues continue to see America in less exalted terms. So I think that's that's at bottom what we're to, what we're looking at. And would you expect that to change maybe under a different type of administration? And I'm thinking about Madeleine Albright's famous statement, you know, that America is the indispensable nation. Um, and yet these sentiments from Democrats seem in, in conflict with that now iconic statement. But maybe it depends on the leadership itself is what you're suggesting. So I think it's partly the leadership. You would you would assume that Republicans will look at the United States in different ways when uh, if a Democrat is president. In fact, they did uh, uh, during the time of Obama, although uh, uh, not to the extent that the, that the Democrats have gone down. Uh, so politics is is sort of a first uh, filter through which to look at uh, at these kinds of numbers. Um, but it goes deeper than that. It goes deeper to the question of what kind of role the United States should have in the world. So while both Democrats and Republicans believe uh, the U.S. should have a leadership role, should be engaged in the world, Democrats overwhelmingly think it should be a shared leadership role, one what we share it with other countries. And uh, Republicans in much larger numbers think uh, it, it should be a dominant leadership role, a role in which the United States sort of de- determines what will happen um, and, and uh, a, a, a leading, whether people follow or not, uh, kind of way. So that's one difference, but there are many others. For anyone who reads the report, another striking difference is the graphic that shows how Democrats, Republicans, and independents see you know, top critical threats of vital interest to the United States. Uh, both Democrats and independents see COVID as a top threat, but it doesn't even appear on the Republicans' top seven list. Similarly, the rise of China as a world power, international terrorism, and large numbers of immigrants and refugees coming into the United States, uh, the top three threats for Republicans, don't appear on the Democrats' top seven list. The first time these groups agree is actually threat number six, uh, that of a global economic downturn. Have you ever seen the list this polarized? No, it's the most polarized we've seen, and that's why we, we wrote uh, the report on this polarization, uh, America Divided. Um, uh, and, and, and it is that threat perception that's really noteworthy. So Democrats believe that the principal threats to the United States are either global, so they put COVID and, and climate change on the top, or uh, societal, right. so they put racial and economic inequality as a key issue. And Republicans have a more traditional view of, of threats, looking at security uh, threats like Iran uh, and, most importantly, China as the emergence of a world power, plus some typical uh, uh, longstanding Republican issues like large numbers of immigrants and refugees coming across the border, uh, as well as domestic violent extremism, uh, which... Uh, um, they see they they see as a threat, but it is that sort of hard power threat mm-hmm. uh, in the old way to think about military and violence that them, that Republicans see, and this more soft, uh, uh, but nevertheless deadly threat uh, like uh, COVID and climate change uh, that distinguish them. And as a result, Democrats and Republicans have a very have a fundamental different view about how to deal with the world, and and perhaps the best way. To encapsulate that was the question we asked at the very start of the uh, uh, of this um, survey, which is, what's the impact of the coronavirus about how uh, the United States should deal with the world? And um, uh, 80% of Democrats believe that the impact of the coronavirus makes it more important for us to coordinate and collaborate with other countries. And 58% of Republicans think it makes it more important that we are self-sufficient as a nation so we don't need to depend on others. I mean, that is a humongous difference in how to think about it. And it is throughout everything else you ask about. Republicans want to basically rely on American power uh, and the ability to deal with the threats that we face. And Democrats want to work with other countries and other institutions to deal with the threat that we all face in common. 
unpacking this theme of polarization, um, you know, so many of us have been thinking about this. I've been reading Ezra Klein's book, Why We're Polarized. And one of his interesting points is that Americans are sorting themselves better into Republicans and Democrats essentially being more efficient about it, which can make it seem in surveys like this that views are changing when maybe we're just better at grouping ourselves. Do you think any of that could be happening uh, in this survey? In other words, would someone who 15 years ago thought about immigration as a threat and identified as a Democrat now identify as a Republican but still have the same view, making it look like the parties are further apart um, when they're actually just self-sorting? Or do you think the data that you've seen over the decades really suggests that views themselves are changing? So it's both. Uh, and they're both problematical. So just because people sort themselves in different buckets doesn't make that uh, uh, easier on the body politic. The more divided you become in different groups, even if it's self-sorted, uh, the less likely it is that you will have compromise between those groups. And the more likely it is that you polarize within the group further and further. So we know from uh, uh, the days in which, you know, the moderate Republicans were to the left of the conservative Democrats, right. those days are gone. They're, they're, they're not there in part because the dynamics force uh, people to become in the Republican Party to go more to the right and the Democratic Party more to the left. So even if vo vo views were not changing, the sorting process is debilitating for a politics based on compromise, which is what democracy ultimately uh, uh, has to be if it is if it is to survive and, and thrive. But there are also changes in views. So on immigration in particular, the Democrats were not that different from Republicans 10 years ago about whether they saw a large number of immigrants coming across the, uh, the border as a threat. Um, they used to be in the 60 to 70 percent, just like Republicans are today. They're now down in the low teens. Why? Because the Democratic Party has changed. It's a very different party. It's less white. It's more multicultural. It's younger. It's people who see immigrants uh, on the main as a positive for the American body politic. Uh, rather than as a negative. And so views have changed at the same time that we've also become more sorted in our uh, in our different political corners, by the way, reading different kinds of news uh, and, and reflecting uh, different kinds of uh, perspectives as, as a result. Another book I'm reading right now is Driving That Home, uh, The Man Who Ran Washington by Peter Baker and Susan Glasser about uh, James A. Baker and all the... Um, you know, the deals cut across party lines, the pragmatism that is missing in Washington right now. Yeah, though, you know, the, uh, it's a great book, by the way, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, towards the end of it uh, as well. Uh, of course, the great thing is that the master of bipartisan politics and of cutting deals across the aisle uh, is so stuck in his own uh, political party in view that uh, when it comes to whether or not he's going to support Donald Trump, he's not he's not there yet. Uh, um, to uh, to think about the possibility of, of crossing it over to the other side. By the way, the side that in his youth, uh, as a Democrat, uh, he used to sit at. Yeah, it's an absolutely fascinating read uh, in this year, for sure. And we'll be right back to talk about American attitudes toward the world. Evo, you really see the lack of American public focus on the Middle East in this survey. The number of Americans who are concerned about the threat of Iran's nuclear program has gone down almost 10 points, even as Iran is in the news given the Trump administration's snapback sanctions, and concerns about terrorism linked in Americans' minds to the region given 9-11 is at the lowest level recorded since the Chicago Council began asking about the threat in 1998, only 54% today. In contrast, concern about China is up. How do you interpret these shifts in what is on Americans' minds? So two ways. I think Americans have looked at uh, the reality of our engagement in the Middle East over the tw past 20 years, since really 9-11, and have soured on that. Clearly, people uh, view, and we have plenty of polling data on this, that our engagement in Iraq, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and other parts of the Middle East has been uh, uh, a disaster uh, for our foreign policy and for our standing in the world, and they want to end it and they want to get out of it, by the way, which is why every president uh, in the past few uh, cycles um, uh, until now has been 
uh, arguing that we should get out of these uh, conflicts. Barack Obama harder than it seems. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's hard to get out, but that that's one reason. I think the other reason is the Middle East just is strategically less important uh, than not only because terrorism is viewed as a lesser threat, and you know when you have um, more Americans dying each week for the past nine months than died on nine eleven. There's a reason why people have reordered their priorities uh, when there has been uh, the, the principal terrorist threat in the United States, frankly, since 9-11, is domestic, not foreign. Um, uh, people's views are changing. And there is, as you mentioned, uh, a souring of the view on, on China. Uh, the U.S. view, American views overall on China are more negative than any other time since diplomatic relations were established in 1978. Uh, other other issues are taking priority. Uh, and so you see a shift from uh, away from the Middle, Middle East. By the way, I think that's a good thing. Uh, I don't think that the Middle East ought to dominate our foreign policy in the way that it did. Um, the kinds of, even in the Obama administration, when there was this attempt to shift away uh, from the Middle East, the vast majorities of major meetings in the Situation Room of the National Security Council and all those people who meet there was on the Middle East. And um, that's frankly not the, the the principal concern of Americans, nor should it be the principal concern of policymakers. Yeah, sort of reordering of priorities. You know, that leads me to think about this data on globalization and trade. Carnegie just issued a report from a task force looking at what kind of foreign policy would support the U.S. middle class. I know this is something that the Chicago Council thinks a lot about, too. And, you know, the impact of globalization and trade is significant part of this analysis. And I'm really fascinated by the idea that big majorities of Americans see international trade as mostly good for consumers, for U.S. relations with other countries, for the economy, even for jobs. And yet it's often seen in a negative way in the elections, especially given your vantage from Chicago and the Midwest. What is your takeaway on that? So it continues to be, in some ways, the, the most surprising uh, uh, finding in each of our surveys. Uh, we did expect that with the pandemic and with the shortages of supplies of PPE, masks, and everything else that was along there, that globalization will be seen increasingly negatively by the American public. Not true. Uh, continues to be 76%, but 65, 65%. So it's two thirds of the American public thinks that globalization is basically a good thing. And the same is true on trade. They're not quite as high as last year's numbers, but they're at, you know, 70 to 80 percent of Americans thinking that, that trade is a good thing uh, for jobs, for them, for consumers, et cetera. And indeed, even when we ask people, do you do you think, which we did, do you think we should have supply chains that have many countries producing critical goods or just the United States? Again, two to two to one. It's many countries. Um, uh, so in that sense, it, it, it is surprising. Uh, on the other hand, here's where politics and public opinion start to diverge. Uh, in Washington, there's an anti-trade perspective, uh, certainly on Capitol Hill. Uh, in the administration, always a pro-trade, but uh, although not with this administration. Um, but on Capitol Hill, there's an anti-trade uh, perspective uh, that used to be only on the Democratic side. It is now Democrats and Republicans um, uh, in, in the main that the only way you can get a new trade agreement through is by arguing how protectionist it is. Protectionist it is. So the U.S., uh, Canada, Mexico uh, uh, agreement that modified NAFTA a bit was sold on its protectionist elements, not on its free trade elements. Um, and there is this idea that somehow in the Midwest there is growing protectionism. Uh, that's true in certain sectors, but it isn't true, for example, for agriculture where clearly farmers know that the, what they are producing is, is more than what America is consuming. So they get it, that they need to sell uh, uh, soybeans and corn and, every, and, 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 and pork and what have you uh, that is being produced in the Midwest. And so it is a much more nuanced view in, uh, in the Midwest than this idea that most Midwesterners are anti-globalization or anti-trade. Uh, in fact, there's no, there's really no discernible difference uh, on public opinion views in, the, uh, on, in, in regional terms 
Uh, what they do worry about is the loss of manufacturing jobs, most of which, by the way, to, make, to technology, not necessarily to trade, uh, and the consequences there. Given the results from the survey uh, and your own analysis, how do you anticipate U.S. foreign policy changing over the next four years, whether that's a second Trump administration or a newly elected Biden administration? Or do you think that it's unlikely that these evolving attitudes will impact policy priorities or that these consistent policy views will impact policy priorities? So uh, I I think the findings suggest two things. One, that uh, there will continue to be support for American engagement in the world. But how to engage is increasingly polarized and now is finding it's a polarization not only among Democratic and Republican voters, but frankly between the president and uh, uh, the opposition candidate, Joe Biden. And in that sense, I think this is an election uh, which, uh, although is not going to be decided on foreign policy grounds, but people will come to the polls and decide to vote on a very different grounds, will have huge foreign policy implications. If Donald Trump gets uh, reelected, the foreign policy implications, the continuation of a much more nationalist, much more anti-alliance, uh, anti-multilateralist, frankly, anti-trade, uh, politics will continue uh, and, in fact, be doubled down. If Joe Biden gets elected, much greater concern to the kind of global uh, uh, issues like COVID and climate change, uh, much more emphasis on working together with international institutions and international partners to dealing with these issues. And in that sense, I do think that you will find the differences that you see between the candidates, which is reflected in the differences you see between the two parties, uh, play out in, in an election. It used to be that, that when it came to foreign policy, politics stopped at the water's edge. It no longer does. It continues throughout uh, the process. And in that sense, this may well be the most consequential foreign policy election since 1940. Does anything from this survey give you hope? Yeah. The biggest thing of hope is that Americans care about the world. They understand that you can not build bigger walls, draw up the bridges, uh, figure out that you can just ignore what's happening in the world. You can't. You have to be part of it. You need to shape that international environment in a way that hopefully benefits Americans as well as much of the rest of the world. There's a basic understanding. The United States may be an independent, sovereign country, but it lives in a world with many other independent and sovereign countries that, for better or ill, need to work together in order to deal with the issues that we all confront together. That's a pretty powerful statement. If you compare to that one, we were, you know, that's just why the 80 years ago was so important. 80 years ago, we decided to join the world uh, after 20 years of not being part of the world. And the basic bet we made 80 years ago was that joining the world ultimately is better for our prosperity, our security, and our freedom than if we just stay at home. And Americans still believe fundamentally in that idea of global engagement and global leadership for the United States. And that's a good thing. Well argued. Thank you, Ivo. Appreciate your time today. My pleasure. Till next time. Thank you for listening to The World Unpacked, produced by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. We're grateful for your listen and eager for your feedback. We welcome your emails at podcasts at ceip.org. And please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find me, Laura Lucas Magnuson, on Twitter, at Laura L. Magnuson. These discussions are only made possible by our wonderful team behind the pod. Our audio engineer is Tim Martin, and our executive producer is Maya Krishna Rogers. We'll see you next time.